Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever, whenever you are. And welcome back to the third and last webinar in this ses uh, session, jointly presented by Swiss Re Institute, Gottlieb Dottweiler Institute, and IBM Research today. This time round, life and in color, and fingers crossed with sound. Again, our apologies for last time's hiccup on the audio level. And if you hadn't had the time yet, the last session about quantification, the metric society, is still available on the event's website with immaculate and, I dare say, crystal clear sound indeed. Today, we show you the way forward, preparing for an uncertain future through digitization and leadership. And I do think somebody leading the way in our troubled times is not a bad idea at all. Troubled by a tiny virus, that is, which is up to no good, choking big parts of the globe in many ways, confronting health systems, governments, communities, organizations, and the economy as a whole. How do we face such a pandemic? How do we make decisions for the future and act with assurance amidst so much uncertainty. Pressing questions, important questions, and we have the scientists and experts here to answer them. Let me introduce first Dr. Karin Wey. Welcome, an eminent innovation and trend expert at the Think Lab at IBM Research Zurich, where she provides with her expert and scientist colleagues uh, a unique forum for decision makers from industry, politics and academia to reflect on emerging societal and technological trends. Her field of expertise ranges from artificial intelligence, intelligence, the future of work and leadership to organizational culture and transformation. Karen, being also an active researcher in said areas and a university lecturer. And finally, being a physicist and a psychologist, I'm utterly convinced we are in good hands today as we are with Dr. Ulrich Schimpel, right next to Karen, the Federal Chief Technology Officer of IBM Switzerland, holding a Master of Science uh, and a PhD in Business and Computer Science. He has over 15 years of industry expertise in government, supply chain and smart grid under his belt, delivering tirelessly sustainable business value by selecting and applying innovative technologies within a holistic business context. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, that's what you get if you hire a guy with a PhD from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and with an MBA from St. Gallen University. That he is a member of the IBM Academy of Technology and of the IBM CTO Europe team goes almost without saying. Good to have you here, Ulrich Schimpel. Welcome to you too. And last but not least, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Peter Starr. Currently, he manages the so-called Scalable Knowledge Ingestion Group at the IBM Research Zurich Laboratory, a group focusing on the development of technologies to ingest large corpora um, of technical documents and extract, respectively, explore the knowledge in them. So indeed, technologies for which facing a flood of scientific papers on the novel coronavirus and COVID-19, there is, I dare say, a pressing need for this kind of technology. Before joining IBM Research, Peter was a postdoctoral researcher in theoretical physics at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And before there, that, he earned there his PhD in theoretical physics. You know, I'm truly terrified, uh, especially by theoretical physicists, because they think about topics, well, of which I don't even understand the headline. Just take Peeper's paper, for example, uh, that earned him his place in the 2015 final of the highly prestigious ACM Gordon Bell Award. The title, the title was as follows, an extreme scale implicit solver for complex PDEs, highly heterogeneous flaw in earth mantle. 
I actually understood for, highly and in, but I'm having a hunch. It's just brilliant to have you here today, Peter. Welcome to you all. Virtual applause, you don't hear it, but I'm sure it's there. As our three speakers uh, are covering very much uh, specific topics, we will have a Q&A right after their respective presentations. So when having a question, and we hope you do have questions for them, um, you would like to put uh, to a certain speaker, please do send your question in either during his or her speech uh, or at the latest at the beginning of her or his Q, uh, individual Q&A. We are looking forward to have as many questions of yours uh, uh, being answered, so keep them coming. So now to the business at hand, beginning with Dr. Peter Starr on how to find a way through oceans of scientific papers, leading you right to the truly critical, truly critical knowledge that will change our slightly miserable world in times of Corona. From me, only so much. I think it has to do with artificial intelligence. Peter, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, hello everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Peter Starr. I work at IBM Research Laboratory and uh, we're working really on technologies that are trying to get all of the information out of the uh, latest publications. Now, um, the thing is that what we saw beginning, beginning February, end of March, when you know, the COVID-19 crisis started in, in Western Europe and was going to ha happen one way or the other in, in the US, we started to see an exponential increase in the uh, publication rate um, <clears throat> of different types of scientific uh, articles related to specifically COVID-19. And it was getting to a point that it is not possible anymore for an individual researcher from different institutes that are trying to find new vaccines or just trying to understand what this disease is to really say, okay, you know, I can really follow what is going on. So, um, and we can just show that very quickly on the slide. So, you know, this is actually a little bit older slide and that actually shows how quickly it's going. So this says 50,000 papers, I think at this point, it's around more than even 100,000 papers published specifically on SARS-CoV-2, uh, more than 1,000 clinical trials, uh, more than 1,000 different drugs mentioned or used in, in, in various things. And so it's clear that one cannot directly uh, follow up just with simply reading. Um, now, <clears throat> it's good that I have a background in theoretical physics because that problem that you just saw here is really not new. Actually, uh, I already had exactly that problem when I was doing my PhD. I started my PhD in 2009, right around in, in the field of superconductivity. There were around, like, I would say, between five to ten pages uh, per uh, uh, papers per day. Uh, by, the end of I, the, the, by the end of my PhD, it was around uh, 100 papers per day. And so back then, this was four or five years ago, uh, it was already clear to me and my manager that uh, back in the time that we needed to really start building technologies that can do that. Um, now, what is this technology? So we call it deep search. Deep search itself is um, a technology to try to get rid of serendipity uh, in discoveries. So what does this mean is typically when people find new discoveries, they just read, they get a gut feeling because they are triggered by something they're reading. Um, and you know, then they need to verify that. And that whole process takes quite a lot of time. As you can see, there's a whole loop of thinking and getting a new ID, verification, and so on and so forth. Now, in order to actually accelerate that, what we want to do is we want to start using and leveraging AI uh, in order to allow the researcher to accelerate the rate of discovery. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the faster we get, for example, a vaccine, or the faster we get any type of insights, the better it is. So for that, we basically have two key services that we're building, cloud deployed, can be also of course on-prem. Um, one is Corpus Conversion Service. Basically, very simply put, it takes a set of documents and converts these documents, think about PDFs, but also PowerPoint, Word, converts these documents into text files with a very specific schema, such that programmers can, you know, programmatically handle the content in these documents. Then we have a second service, which is the Corpus Processing Service. The Corpus Processing Service essentially um, puts these, each document, each converted document into context by putting it into a graph. So basically, and I will exploit, uh, explain that a little bit later, every document can become a node, every author can become a node, you can have a link between the author and the document, but you can also go into what the document is talking about, the entities, the diseases, the uh, drugs that are being mentioned, and so on and so forth. Each of that becomes uh, an individual node with links. And that allows you to then exploit that graph to start generating, for example, data sets, which allows you to, for example, say, okay, list me now all of the drugs that have been uh, mentioned so far and what their effects were. 
I will show you that in a little bit more detail uh, later. Now, Corpus Convergence Service. So as I said, <coughs> the concept is very simple. We published it also in, in top conferences so that uh, if people are interested, you can look at that. It is also a key technology in Watson Discovery Service, so in our, in our, uh, uh, in our best brands. But essentially, we start from a document. We identify the um, uh, structural components, so cells, lines. We then classify each one so that you can identify what's the title, what's the abstract, what's the table, what's the rows and columns in the table. And then we transform that into, uh, into a text file that you can then uh, with a certain schema. And essentially what we, what we, what we have is a scalable, as, as, the present, uh, as, as the presenter said, a very scalable um, um, infrastructure that allows us to ingest these 50, 100,000 documents uh, very, very quickly uh, in a massive parallel uh, way. So you can actually use many computers at the same time so that we can have a turnaround and we can continuously rebuild the knowledge graph um, uh, with, the, with the latest documents. And below, I just show you one of the PLOS in which we're applying these machine learning algorithms as well as um, you know, the, all of the tools that we have to quickly build, train, and evaluate whether these models are, are there. So we have a continuous process to um, apply AI models as well as improve AI models through uh, human annotation. Now, once you have converted each document, you can think about each, each scientific paper, each, but also, for example, a patent, maybe also a clinical trial. After I converted that, I have for each of these, com each of these items, I just have a, have a file, a JSON file, a text file with a certain schema. And so what we then want to do is, we have, at this point, we've just converted it. So we, now we need to start getting the content out and being able to query that. And so that, for that one, we have the second service, which is the corpus processing service. Here we start using, an, uh, uh, an using um, the latest NLP methods uh, to find entities and relationships between those entities in text. Uh, and again, entities can be as simple as symptoms, drugs, uh, maybe some conditions, comorbidities, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and that, again, we have a very scalable system to apply all of these AI models to quickly train them. And then after we have built that knowledge base in a backend database, we load that up into an in-memory knowledge graph so that the queries that we do can be done very, very fast as opposed to queries that would be very slow uh, on a database. To actually build this knowledge base, we have a very uh, structured pipeline. It starts from the documents. We extract each of the components of the documents. This means uh, the paragraphs, the uh, tables, uh, the images. We then run uh, NLP annotators or image annotators sometimes on them to find the entities and the relationships. And then afterwards, we aggregate the entities and we aggregate the relationships. Because for example, if you would have the drug rem remdesivir, you only want to have, of course, one node. And it will be mentioned in many different paragraphs with many different uh, relationships. All of this is done in such a way on the platform that we can uh, quickly generate those graphs. So typically, it takes around an hour or two um, to, to create graphs of, of 100 million nodes. Just to give you a very, very, very simpli simplified thing, I will also show you later a more complex one. So this is more like a, <coughs> a sketch or a, a cartoonish picture. But essentially, you again, we start from the articles. We build paragraphs, tables, images. The reason why we actually split it up is so that when you actually you are doing a query, you would like to always have back the provenance. So one of the reasons why we're actually using the graph and not, for example, a deep neural network that is just going to do Q&A is that it's very difficult for a, deep cure, uh, for a deep neural network to actually have um, provenance as to why I'm coming up with a certain answer. And clearly in this case, and especially in technical cases, it's extremely important that we know when uh, or why we get a certain answer and that we can trace back to the origin. Because maybe some paper is highly hypothetical and provides an answer, but that is not good. So we can actually exploit all of these capabilities in the graph to not only provide answers to queries, but also provide you the provenance as to where is this information coming from and why am I getting this information. On this slide, you can actually see that starting from articles, we have paragraphs, tables, and, and, and images that allows us to search very deep into the document that you not just get the title of a document, but actually is a very specific part of the document. And then you can link that with other databases such as DrugBank, GeneBank, to start seeing the nice information that you have in these databases and interlink that with the sparse information that is coming from the documents. Just to give you very specifically on COVID-19 now, so essentially what the deep search really allows us to do is to aggregate very quickly different, uh, radically different types of data and interlink them and allow the, the, the person to actually use all of this in interlinked information. So we focus for the moment on four big uh, components. One is core 19 data sets. So this is a combination of PDF documents as well as JSON documents. 
The drug bank, which is a database mentioning all of the drugs uh, that are out there. Gene bank, a database that is mentioning all of the genes. Uh, and then the clinical trials. And we are able to, of course, get all of the information from the bio archive, met archive, uh, chem archive, as well as other um, uh, open repositories um, that are publishing uh, the data. Now, when we do that, we essentially get the graph um, that is, um, if we just restrict only for SARS-CoV-2, it will be around, um, I think, 10 million nodes and, and, and 60 million edges. If we look at all of the information with regard to um, um, so the original SARS as well as MERS, it would be around uh, 10 million nodes and 180 uh, million um, um, edges. And what is really nice about our approach is that we are extremely agile. So when it started about mid-March, end of March, uh, in, in after two weeks, we were able to already publish the first um, graph on the web that people could freely access uh, and, start, and start querying. And last but not least, and I want to, I want to leave it here, because you can, this is actually a screenshot, the right, uh, the right picture is a screenshot of the actual um, um, <clears throat> reports that we are publishing. So we are continuously trying to get actually um, a list out of what are all of the latest used drugs that we find in the literature, uh, linked together directly with all of the articles as well as the, as the clinical reports, um, or the clinical trials, sorry, that are being mentioned. We're also doing this for the genes. The genes are extremely important to identify what is actually, um, you know, what, what should we start looking for for, uh, um, um, for the vaccines and stuff like that. And now we're starting to work also with external partners, uh, specifically for protein-protein uh, interaction and understanding what is being found um, and what the effects are, for example, of certain proteins on the neural, uh, on the, um, uh, what is it called again, the, the, the neural, um, 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 the brain, uh, what, is it? what is it called again? The neural system essentially that has all of the, um, I don't know the name now. Anyway, um, the, um, um, about, uh, about the neural um, network essentially, yeah, exactly. Uh, in the, in the, but now the biological one, not the, not the artificial one, right? Um, that connects the brain and everything else. And um, uh, as well as also other kind of protein-protein uh, interactions. And so with that, I, uh, that was my last slide. So, <laughs> Well, Question. ladies and gentlemen, I do think I haven't promised you too much. Uh, Peter managed to uh, show us a whole new world within uh, less than 12 minutes, actually. Um, <clears throat> there are actually uh, quite a bunch of questions. And please, ladies and gentlemen, if you have more questions for Peter, this would be the very moment in time to send them oh, to us. One, one last statement is that oh, this sorry. stuff, this, yeah, that's very good. but. Um, the, this stuff is all public on the on the web, so you can go there and actually exploit the graph. Um, of course, if you have, if you think that this is very interesting and you would like to engage with us, there are also ways that we can, for example, uh, interlink this graph with with your proprietary data if that would be interesting to you. So the public data is all there out of the web. You can use that. You just have to register uh, because of GDPR, obviously. <laughs> um, um, but all the rest, yeah, you, you, you can reach out anytime. And we are doing that also right now with, with certain partners. A truly important last note yes. indeed. Um, as I said, there are quite a bunch of questions already been sent in, which is excellent. And just keep <coughs> on coming while we are at our Q&A. We have around uh, eight to ten minutes with Peter for Q&A. So I start right away with the first question, which is concerned with... Um, the, the way to, to, to convert the files you have, maybe a PDF mm -hmm. yeah. or a Word file or whatever. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question because this technology is not only, can not only be applied for this COVID-19 no, no, uh, no. uh, 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 search area no. or whatever. And, and the question is coming, of course, from an insurance guy. Yes. He's asking, how accurate is uh, artificial intelligence slash machine learning in recognizing handwriting? Particularly handwriting, interesting yeah. for the insurance sector in claims handling. Um, so handwriting is something that, that we have been working on quite a bit. Um, it's still, I would say, it's good enough, but not good enough that people would like it to be. There are a few um, startups that we've also talked about in, in, in Israel that are working on it. Um, it really factually depends on what you want to do. So if you, um, if you really want to do the conversion, that's typically not very easy to do. Um, however, if you just want to do search, which is not the conversion, and then do some 
uh, some uh, post-processing on top of that to do some statistics or whatever. But if you just say, I would like, and I guess that's, that's probably where, where the insurance wants to go, if I would like to search for a certain claim that references these and these and these concepts, that's actually easier. So that you can actually, there are technologies out there that you can do. So you could do that, basically? You can, you, it, it depends exactly how you, how you approach a problem. If you want to, if you want to process the, 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 if you want to transcribe, literally, this yeah. is what I write and this is the string, that is tricky. There are certain technologies that do that, but they, are, they have some caveats. They will not always work perfectly. Um, similarly for OCR, by the way. Um, um, but if you actually just say, I would like to find in a certain document a, um, a certain um, anything that's related to a certain key concept, like more like search, like pull the document out mm -hmm. but don't transcribe it, that's actually much easier to do. And there, oh. there's other technologies. So there's a slight, a slight difference in it and it depends on how you want to actually use it. How, how about human speech? That's another question. Images, sound files, video clips and all that. Yes, there is, there is technologies out there, even on, I think even on the Watson Cloud, that, that can do a lot there, really a lot. So Which there is, is also IBM related, I yes, think. Yes, of course, yes. <laughs> of course. Right, are there another question? Data sources from medical reports and diagnoses? Um, yes, we have been contacted to do that. Um, of course, the graph that is public is not going to have that. Um, but it is relatively straightforward to do that straight. So indeed, um, we can we could, could interlink with with other data sources. Yes. All right. I see. There's a question uh, which is connected to something we just talked about, but I think uh, if you if you might explain a little bit more in depth, that might be great. This approach seems to be limited, where you can rely on databases, on clinical studies, on drugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that right, or is, is no, the variety no, of no, possibilities it's, bigger? It's, it, I would say it's the opposite way around. So. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take the best of both worlds. Okay, so it's there is a lot of work that has gone in into getting all of these databases in the first place. So we want to use that, and there's a lot of structured data, and so it's extremely important that you use that. Um, and you can think about that as like as, as your seed of the knowledge graph, because that is where all of the actual entities and relationships that you can use. Um, now, having that seed, um, typically the problem is that these Manually curated databases are not very big, plus they are very dense, you know, you get a lot of information. Um, on the other side, you know, you can see there's a dipole. On the other side, you, you have actually all of the public literature that is out there. It's extremely sparse. Not everything will be discussed. Um, it is not very, sometimes not very precise intentionally. Think about like patterns, right? And so, but it's a lot, right? And so what you want to do is you want to actually inter interweave those. So you have you can see the one part, the databases as ground truths, the other part as, 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 as um, things that allow you to actually make more connections. So for example, a very concrete example is we use that exactly, that technology exactly for an aluminum company. So there was a book with around 501, I believe of 511, I don't remember, very specific aluminum alloys with all of their properties listed, right? Okay, that's 511, how much statistics can you do? Then you apply that on 10,000 patterns that have all the different types of aluminum alloys, and you get 100,000 different aluminum alloys, right? But not every property is measured for that one. And, you know, you have to do a lot of NLP to get all of this data out. But so that's the difference. So basically you're like from 500, so you're two orders of magnitude different. So if 500 is close to 1,000, right? 100,000, you have two orders of magnitude difference. Um, one thing, the patterns is very sparse, the other one is very dense, but you want to merge those two together, essentially. And we do the same thing with, with, with this case. There's clearly a lot of um, information already in the databases which you want to exploit, but there is also new information coming out from, from, the, from, the, from the articles. And so we kind of merge these two things together. Another very interesting question, I think, uh, which you probably can answer rather quickly. Assuming that later papers are more current than older ones, uh, how do you wait time in showing papers? Is, is that, is that yes. a concern of yours? Yes, you? so basically uh, there's two ways either you can, so there's two, two ways you can look at that. One is um, we do extract, for example, dates, so you can actually filter straight on the date and say, okay, not more, not less, not more than that. Um, um, it is, however, like a sort of cuts on two sides, right? So if you start waiting less uh, older papers, um, 
you know, there might be good ideas that are actually hidden in the older papers that you might want to re-explore, right? So for that reason, we are, what we typically do is we typically have a graph where we don't do this weighting. Um, and the ones that we publish, we don't do this weighting because we want to give everybody the same voice, right? It's the same thing as a bit like saying, okay, you're not important, you are important. I think that's not our business. Um, but what we can do is we can actually say, okay, let's make, for example, only the papers from, uh, uh, from this period onwards. So only the papers from, let's say, May onward and so on and so forth. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, just one last, yes, yes, we have time for one last question. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we get a lot of questions. Uh, how can one access and explore these graphs uh, that have been compiled by, by you clever people? Yeah. And the moderator, moderator has been kind enough to already give you the uh, URL uh, yeah. on, on this chat. So yeah. you find it, I think it's one of the last, the second last post of the moderator actually is the uh, 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 URL. You find the URL also on the event website later on, as you will find all the slides and all the presentations of our uh, highly esteemed uh, experts today as well. Last question, as I said, is the system leveraging a human-made knowledge graph for semantic disambiguation? I do suppose you understand the question. Yes. I only uh, the, the, the short answer is um, yes. Um, of course. Um, the, the thing is we, we have, so this is, it's not a black box, so we have a lot of knobs to tune. And so we, we, can, we can use this semantic disambiguation, which is in certain cases very, very important, especially in the medical case. Um, and um, yes, we use that essentially. You do that, yes. indeed. L last question from my side, um, as this, as this uh, I just wonder who and how many are actually using this novel service IBM is offering, uh, 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 using its as well as, uh, uh, So AI. we have, uh, <clears throat> on the public service, we have, we have uh, more than 500 users now. Um, uh, they have to register? They, they are the registered ones, yes, that they're actually using. Um, for actually visiting and looking at the reports, typically we get something like, I think, 2,000 hits or 3,000 hits a day. Quickly, what's the feedback? Say again? The feedback of these people? Um, well, they, they clearly like it because they're coming back, so it's, <laughs> it's, it, that's good. Um, we try to be as, as agile as possible, obviously, um, um, because this just came on, on top of all of our other client engagements that we're doing. Um, and then, of course, we have all the other, you know, more the not public engagements that we're currently doing to, re related to that to see, you know, how we can use that with uh, data from the clients, actually, and kind of augment their, uh, their use case. Excellent. Many thanks, Dr. Peter Thank Starr, you. ladies and gentlemen, introducing us to the world of machine learning, deep search and yep. artificial intelligence for a very, very good course indeed. Well, now we move on to our next topic and our next speaker, Dr. Ulrich Schimpel, who will discuss strategies, how organizations can make the most of digital transformation to increase operational resilience and flexibility. A transformation which is facing a pandemic, mind you, not really optional anymore, but I think a bare necessity. Ulrich, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And welcome also from my side uh, to the audience out there. Um, yeah, it's a, my pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, resilience and flexibilities, <clears throat> two large and important topics. Uh, we can definitely only touch a few points on this. Um, and uh, there's a lot more out there. And again, yeah, please reach out uh, if, if you want, social media or email. Uh, the question is really, what is re resilience and flexibility, how can we achieve it? And also much more, uh, well, interestingly, uh, why do we need it? Um, and in fact, actually, it's not something that we uh, encounter in the past three months or six months, depending on how you see it, but it goes uh, far beyond what we have been experiencing uh, in this year so far. So uh, just, um, feeling a bit the pulse, and I'm, you know, there are so many different aspects out of this, but taking out two examples of uh, how this is, uh, the pandemic has been impacting us. Um, over 80% of the global organizations actually enforced home office policies. And you might have experienced that yourself um, with all the challenges that come, uh, professional challenges that come with it, but also maybe at home, 
you have a family and kids that are not going to school. So that is definitely impacting us. And only now we are slowly uh, returning to office life. And again, you might have experienced that this office life is quite different from uh, the office life we had before. So definitely that is impacting us. Uh, what is also quite sad to mention is that uh, this, regarding the cyber risk, uh, we are basically hit with uh, over 40 times more spam that was piggybacking on uh, this COVID situation. And uh, even more severe, uh, a lot of malware and criminal cyber activities are actually trying to pr uh, take profit, make profit out of this uh, special situation and are torpedoing uh, our, um, yeah, our ambitions and our activities um, to get uh, hold of and master this situation. And we all have heard of these uh, uh, situations where even hospitals who are fighting for the life of people have been hacked, right, and, and, and could not do their job, which is truly despicable, of course. So now if we um, actually look at how uh, successful organizations um, uh, deal in these um, areas of disruption or when a disruption uh, strikes, it's they have the ability to immediately switch gears. Uh, switch gears from normal operations to a survival mode. So all decisions are really focusing on the survival of the organization, of the employees, and the whole operations. And if there is anything left, uh, especially for this global um, health uh, crisis, uh, they actually uh, contribute to the common welfare, which is something we have been uh, observing and doing ourselves, and you probably have been seeing uh, across the globe, uh, where everyone stands together to uh, actually get over this uh, exceptional situation. And anything else would be actually harmful um, interestingly, you see survival, and if you look at companies and organizations, you talk to them, you find the topic survival on their agenda, not just during the recent pandemic. Actually, the topic survival has been on the agenda of uh, executives and organizations uh, in 2019, 2020, and, and years before. And isn't that interesting, right? Well. Actually, we are in a situation where global trade wars, where uh, the um, geopolitical situations are disrupting us, not only in the past three months, right? And uh, the digitization itself actually is quite uh, high on, 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 on the, or is impacting the agenda of uh, the organizations and lead to this survival mode. Now, what happens usually once you are in the survival mode uh, and you are slowly getting to organize, uh, organizations then usually go into more simplification. So you're trying to master the situation, you're trying to streamline things, and ultimately then going back to scaling again. And you yourself can actually ask um, about your company or yourself, you know, in which of these different modes are you? Are you in the survival mode? Um, are you already mastering the situation and confident that you're now going into the simplification? Or are you already in the scaling? And um, if you look, look at Amazon, for example, or other organizations, they have been completely different uh, reactions to the crisis. They had to hire 100,000 people uh, just to master the massive uh, increase of online deliveries. So uh, in this whole context where your suppliers, your customers, your financial investors, your stakeholders, your government, you yourself and your employees, your families are somewhere between this survival, simplification, scaling mode. You can imagine um, how uh, difficult it is to have an overview. Now, how would you actually describe the situation and maybe the situation of the past three months in one single word? Well, it's actually a very simple word, and you might have known or heard it, VUCA. Uh, it relates to the concept or the observation that we are in a world facing extreme volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And by its very definition, you cannot get rid of it. You cannot eliminate them. You cannot know 
the unknown unknown, right? And the complexity is there. And the, uh, no matter how much forecasting and AI you do, uh, these are ways to mitigate and to reduce some of the Im implications. But there is always an inherent uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity that we have to deal with. We have heard VUCA uh, in the past uh, definitely uh, months, but also years. And also the new normal is just another word that we uh, see trending. But if you, again, look at the supply chain management community or logistics community, they have been using that terms 10 years back. So thinking what actually happened, but you had tsunamis, Fukushima, again, volcanoes erupting and so on. So this is not something new. Of course, it's now in an extreme scale, also around the whole globe, affecting basically everyone and basically simultaneously with only very little time shift. But this has been around for a while. And the question is, how can we now deal with this? And I think here we really get to the point where we say resilience is uh, essential. Now, how do we actually get to this resilience, uh, to the flexibility? What can we do about it? And um, it starts well before such a disruption or crisis uh, strikes. Um, it starts with the preparation. And uh, you might have uh, experienced that in your own organization as well. Um, contingency plans, right? Uh, in Switzerland, that is actually a legal requirement uh, for corporate governance, that you do have contingency plans, right? So uh, if you already anticipated some extreme scenarios, it's, of course, one of the best ways of resilience or to increase the resilience that you can follow some first um, uh, guidelines. Of course, not having fully encompassed the situation, you cannot, right? And then when it happens, um, basically, they are doing a triage on business continuity and uh, focus on the productivity. Um, and as you're slowly getting out of this survival mode, right, then actually there is an action guide, and this has been published by our CIO, uh, a four-step action plan, how you then can actually prepare for the next VUCA event, right? And, and again, we, this is not the first time. It's an extreme situation, but the next uh, uh, disruption will come for sure. There are four different aspects, uh, or the four steps. It's on the application landscape. Um, it's about network capacity. Many people actually had severe issues here with the working from home situation. The workplace itself and the processes. And again, a lot of details and a, a lot of uh, things can be done here, only very briefly going into uh, them uh, here. And you can reach out whenever you want to discuss more. So application landscape, definitely modern technologies like these multi and hybrid cloud uh, technologies that we are using and that are out there. You can have self-services, automated services, including AI-enabled services. And that is increasing your resilience also via multi-sourcing. Uh, in supply chain communities, sole sourcing has been a risk, a tremendous risk for many, many, many years. And I think this is also what we are now seeing in the IT uh, domain, that you want to have flexibility, resilience here, always combined. And I think that is very important with the security. Network capacity, you might have experienced this as well. You go home and there were bandwidth uh, uh, issues. Uh, some of them related to this virtual private networks where you try to and uh, where you try to secure everything. And here also we see a trend. New technologies actually assume a zero trust security strategy that you assume nothing is secure, but you are using the full bandwidth of the internet um, and with endpoint detection to uh, basically be more resilient to use all the resources that are available for your continuous operations. Um, workplace, those organizations that are used to working remotely or uh, actually work from anywhere is definitely something uh, that were less hit by the lockdown. And uh, here, uh, this is something to embrace um, for organizations. Um, last but not least, these processes um, to look into and here, we have been looking into lean for a long time. But lean and efficiency actually is exactly the opposite of resilient. Because you are 
operating, you're executing on very strong assumptions that the world around you is um, stable. And you know this from uh, auto manufacturing or the automotive industry, where suppliers then build warehouses just in front of your production site to buffer for the uncertainty, just that the large uh, uh, manufacturer then can operate in a lean and efficient way. Um, so again, resilience here on the processes, I think, uh, is definitely something where, which you can gain by competences, increased um, competences of your employees and the management of your whole organization, right? Empowered and uh, um, organization, just like for yourself. And a targeted questioning, right? Is efficiency really the utmost objective? Or where is the balance between simplification and efficiency and the uh, resilience that we need whenever a disruption actually strikes? All that, and I think this is something I, I would definitely uh, let you take home uh, as an as a, as a important thought. We observe that there are massive uh, activities uh, on, on, on cyber criminal activities and, and, and cyber activities, which, uh, which are exploiting, tar really specifically exploiting that people are in an unfamiliar environment with um, uh, working from home, different processes and so on, and, and, and the VUCA world. And uh, it's quite shocking to see that over 70% of the companies do not have a response plan to that. So just think about it, right? What is your valuable resources? What is your valuable data? How is it protected? Uh, how, is, how can you restore it? And what are the procedures on that? So a minimum uh, of a, a cyber in, a security incident response plan is clearly no luxury in these times, sadly, but uh, much more importantly today. So summing all up, um, I guess on the one hand, we see that uh, this uh, pandemic is an extreme incarnation of a VUCA um, uh, event. And uh, resilience is clearly the driver to really make us um, uh, overcome and, um, this pandemic. And yet we see that uh, the priorities of the uh, organizations are always survival, right? Digitization, again, uh, different, uh, the, also the innovator's dilemma, right? You will always come to a point where you are in the survival mode. And then you're going into the simplification um, to streamline and scaling just that another uh, disruption and the other challenges um, will come on your agenda. With that, thank you very much. Many thanks, Ulrich, for your insights. So far, there's been only one question sent in. It's an interesting one, but it is actually one I hopefully don't forget to ask at the very end. And uh, I would love to have an answer from all three of you because it tends to get into the area of expertise of Karen's. So uh, we save that question. Rolf, wherever you are, we save that question for the very end of uh, this session. But I've got a question for you, Ulrich. Um, on the second last or third last uh, slides of yours, uh, you said 76% of all businesses have no response plan. Uh, is, that a glo is that relating globally or is that Switzerland? No, that is a, a report that actually we were doing and we are uh, talking to uh, a selected number of customers in, in the world, yeah. All oh, right. Um, are, those rather, are, are those rather small and uh, medium enterprises, uh, these 76%? These is that people who think, well, we're a small company, who, who's, going to, who's going to target us? There's nothing to gain from us. Well, probably there is. What do you yeah, say? I, I think, uh, of course, there is a, a certain bias. If you have, have a large organization, uh, you, of course, also have the, the, the processes and structures in place to, to cover them. But nevertheless, uh, what, what we also see is that many times this is not really a consistent uh, plan, but uh, more things, oh, yeah, we have this and this in place, and maybe it's not really uh, done in, in, a, in an organized way. And the, just think about it, it's also webcams, right? It's not just the, your, your laptop. It can be anything, right? Uh, any IoT device that you're having is a potential entry door or target for these attacks. And but can small businesses afford to have a response plan or would you rather say they cannot afford to have no response plan? Well, 
I would turn it around. Can small businesses afford to go out of business? I think, and that's why I said a minimal response plan, it's really, when it strikes you, it can take months to get it back. And that is something where you at least should have thought about, right? If you then decide to do this or that, it's up to you. But to never have thought about it, I think that is something uh, you should not risk. Sheer and utter negligence and uh, avoidable, as you obviously say. In the face of the COVID-19 challenges you listed, it's not only, of course, COVID-19 challenges, VUCA, I mean. Um, on a scale of one, being not at all, and 10 totally, how resilient were companies before the corona outbreak? <laughs> well, it's always hard to say how resilient something is. Uh, how, how secure is, 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 a, is a castle if nobody breaks in, right? So um, uh, I think there are, that the companies in, in different industries face these changes, these drastic changes of be that digitization, be this uh, geopolitical influences, trade wars or whatever. And um, whenever that, uh, that strikes, of course, people have contingency plans or, or workarounds. Um, I personally believe that with, um, with this pandemic, uh, a lot of the people are uh, seeing their weak spots, right? And also how to ease, rather easily overcome things like, you know, working from home. Why was that an issue at all, right? Um, and this is maybe just out of uh, tradition, right? That, uh, yeah, we want to be face to face. We fly to a, to a, a meeting for half a day uh, around the globe. Uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, resilience always has to do with uh, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, spending a lot of money on infrastructure or, or processes, but it can also be actually changing old processes and uh, being less efficient sometimes where you can actually afford it to the benefit of being more flexible also to counterattack uh, your competition. Yeah. Last question. Uh, you said obviously this will have an effect. It will have an impact what, what we're going through now. It will change resilience. It will change awareness concerning resilience. On the other hand, I mean, in Switzerland, we had uh, introduced, there was, there was a referendum, uh, very popular in Switzerland, a referendum about pandemic law. And it was, it was approved by more than 70% yes. That was three years ago. Mm -hmm. We were lacking face masks. On, and, and it was in this pandemic law. How long until people again forget about having a response plan because the threat is not that urgent, that acute anymore? Yeah, I think that's, that, that's the uh, main pattern, right? Uh, the, the, the longer you run and uh, you, you don't uh, need to rely on, on response plans or you don't rely on your backup or you re rely on, 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 on your, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, processes, then you forget about them. The, the emergency call line to the police for the alarm bell, if it has never rung, right? Why, why, why should I keep it? Um, we see that always, and. I mean, I don't know how to say that in a politically correct way, but I think there are many, many incidents happening around the world. Uh, and if you open the eyes, I think you can very clearly see where the different hotspots are coming from and to think how you and your organization uh, should respond to that. Right. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have here two more questions have come in so far. We don't have the time to, to, to ask Ulrich them, but Ulrich, I'm sure if these people address you personally by an email or something, LinkedIn you email. would be ever so ready to answer these questions. Absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, there you go. You get a full, complete service here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, get to our esteemed physicist slash psychologist, because at the human end of a crisis, and I do think uh, we all agree that the corona pandemic qualifies as an officially certified crisis, at the human end of such a crisis, must be the ability to handle challenges, to recover from setbacks, to bounce back smart and strong and to maintain performance. Karen will take you there. Karen, we are all ears. Thank you. So also a warm welcome from my side to the audience out there. 
I think we all have experienced that COVID-19 is stressful and it will be for a long, undetermined time. What has become clear so far is the fact that this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And then the question comes up, how can we emerge for, from this situation effectively? In the business world right now, there's a lot of discussion on exercising personal and organizational resilience strategies. At IBM, for example, um, developing resilience is a crucial part of the leadership philosophy. So being resilient means two things. The ability to bounce back from adversity, but also the ability to grow from challenges. Are some people born more resilient than others? Sure, but do not make a mistake. Building resilience is something anyone can do. And uh, research has identified four areas for boosting personal resilience. So it's reflecting um, on thoughts and controlling emotions, relating to others, nourishing mind and body, and realizing meaning. And let's now have a closer look um, at some of them. So when you are facing a challenging situation, what do you do? Most people start to worry. Um, imagine this, you have already a lot on your plate. Um, so an important project deadline is coming up, you have to finalize um, a presentation for a um, key client and then suddenly your manager calls and tells you um, a report you have prepared for the board needs a major revision due tomorrow. So in that situation, um, when it's um, very likely that catastrophic thinking and anxiety might loom around the corner, your thoughts might start circling like this. Oh no! This is too much. I don't have time. I cannot do this. And then your thoughts go around and around and around. We are prone to that kind of thinking. We have 60,000 thoughts per day. 95% of them are repetitions. And 80% of those are negative. But catastrophizing is blocking purposeful action. So, um, Positive psychology recommends instead the following approach. First, try to pause, step back, and then um, pay attention to physical cues of stress. Try to deep a few, have a few deep breaths. Practice mindfulness. Be in the present moment. Notice your emotions to minimize their hold on you. Get curious about the challenging situation, and that's really important. Um, so ask yourself questions to detach from the situation. Um, what do I really know exactly? Um, what assumptions am I making? What else do I need to know? This allows then for reframing and for finally for purposeful action. Let's now shift gears and look at um, nourishing mind and body. So among leaders, you often find a fatal belief that could really stem from, uh, let's say, a Marines boot camp. So the longer we tough it out, the tougher we are, and the more successful we will be. But research clearly shows that uh, this is wrong. So um, there is a direct correlation between the lack of recovery and an increase of health and safety problems. So if you disrupt your sleep by thinking about work or you're constantly watching your phones, then you are weakening your strength. The key to resilience is trying really hard, then stopping, recovering, and then trying again. Sounds easy, but as we all know, it isn't. Another approach to resilience I would like to mention is realizing meaning. So 50% of the employees in the US, they tell you um, that their work is about half as meaningful as it could be. But 
um, having meaning, seeing meaning in its work um, could lead to significant performance improvements. Um, and there are a lot of studies uh, about this um, out there. Here is one. A fundraising team should raise money for a university development project. And they were divided into three groups. Um, and only the first group had direct contact with the benefiting students. And that only for 10 minutes. But it made a huge difference. They were much more dedicated to their work and uh, they were able to raise 171% more money than the other two groups. And uh, what I um, finally want to mention is how you can increase team resilience. So there are four things resilient teams have in common. They believe they can effectively complete tasks together. They share a common mental model of teamwork and um, know exactly what it needs to be done and how roles fit into the big picture. They are able to improvise because they um, clearly know what knowledge, skills, abilities the others have in the team. Think about the great creative response of the Apollo 13 missions operations team when they had to get the astronauts uh, safely back to Earth. And the last point resilient teams share it's um, so trust one another and feel safe. So to sum it up, I have shown a few aspects um, how to embrace resilience. And um, you can try it for yourself. If you are a manager, you can also try to pass this on to your team. You are a role model, you can coach your team, you can find ways how to increase um, the resilience um, of your team. And um, if we all do that, then um, research shows that uh, we should be very well prepared for the uncertain future of the new normal that's going to come. So thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Karen. Highly interesting. Uh, 60,000 thoughts per day, is that right? Yes, that's right. And, and how many, 95 or 85% are repetitions? 95% are repetitions. Is that a waste of time or is there a reason that we keep repeating thoughts? No, um, that's, um, I would say, <laughs> so evolution <laughs> has come up with this, um, but uh, it keeps us really um, in the normal track. In, and so what we nowadays in our modern world have to do more and more to be innovative. And then it stands in our way. That's all right, for sure. I see. But basically, it's, it's, not basic, it's not only a waste of time. No, it's, it's not it's only a, a waste of time. Our brain's wasting our precious time, <laughs> blimey, as time is money. How Depends important, on the surrounding. <laughs> how important yeah. is sleep, after all? You mentioned the tough managers, you know, saying, I can handle that. I'm, I'm, I'm the toughest of them all. We all hear about managers bragging, oh, I only need four or five hours of sleep. Yeah, that's, is that wise? No, that's a clear myth. So um, that's also research finding that you need seven to eight hours sleep uh, per night. Um, you can also you can try um, to change that for a certain amount of time, but uh, it's not wise in the end. So you really need to see that you have um, enough sleep and a good quality sleep. And this is also difficult for many people today because um, so until the last minute before they go to bed, they are then um, trying to do something on the computer or on the phone or um, yeah, um, do something on the electronic media. And so this is also research finding uh, that this really then can disrupt um, the quality of sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard it here first, the best excuse ever for coming too late to the office. Um, I promised you this very one question uh, we had, which is actually directed to all our panelists here. Um, how important, and it goes indeed in your f field of expertise, how important do these IBM experts and leaders see the value of in-person leadership, dialogue, exchange and collaboration as compared to remote digital approaches as forced to be practiced due to COVID-19? I'm sh I think it sure does have an impact. Karen. Yes, so um, you cannot really skip the direct contact. 
and uh, just uh, think, for example, about uh, what's going on um, in the tea kitchen in an organization. So there you are communicating with people, so it really helps to relate to the others. But more than that, so you also um, can encounter a moment of serendipity. Somebody tells you something, um, and then this leads to new ideas uh, you might have regarding your project. So um, the direct contact um, so is you, you really cannot um, afford to skip that. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you come back reluctantly from uh, uh, your home office back to the office, it's not only bad, it's not only bad, it's actually great to see your colleagues again. And I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. So, um, I think we leave it there. I think there's nothing to add, gentlemen, is there? Karen said it all. You do agree. Many thanks. Many thanks, Karen, making sure that the human element is not being forgotten in this context. Thanks to all our experts today, Dr. Peter Starr, Dr. Ungri Schimpel, and of course, Dr. Karen Wey in the name of our audience. Thank you for joining us today. Coming to an end of this third and last webinar, allow me to mention for a last time the email uh, with a little survey cunningly put together by our hosts. Have a look into it, into the survey, fill it in. This has indeed been a new format for all of us instead of a full-scale normal conference, which was planned, of course, uh, as we were used to it. With you, esteemed audience, networking and debating during breaks and lunches, with me having a keen and crisp live audience <laughs> without looking into a camera, it wasn't meant to be this year. But you might remember that I, that I started this session at the very beginning, about an hour ago today, with my fingers crossed uh, for the decent audio. Uh, and I think we had decent audio today. Indeed, I'm getting thumbs up. Well, I have again fingers crossed for this conference to take place in 2021 with a keen and crisp live audience with networking and debating with lunches and drinks and new insights inspiring speakers topics and so on i promise i will hug each and every one of you in person if this happens so fingers crossed or maybe this is a threat for you you decide but it would mean this crisis is all behind us and that would be a good thing so be prepared ladies and gentlemen thank you all for being glued to your screens thank you for being part of this in the name of swiss re institute gottlieb dudweiler institute and ibm research and until then stay healthy stay curious and see you around next year life good luck take care